Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, if you didn't already know where you are, we're going to talk about programming the management of teams so that you don't have to do everything by hand anymore. Um, I wish Mr. Homestead, wherever he's hiding, had actually done the hacked attack earlier in the, in the uh, conference because then I could build off of it. But um, he didn't. So we'll just have to uh, assume he did and we'll play off of that. Um, I'm Seth Schumacher. I'm, well, before I get to that, thank you to everyone who makes this possible. Um, if you just missed them, we had Momentum in here doing a Can You Do It on Teams phones. Landis has been here for many years sponsoring the conference and HP and Audio Coach as well. So thank you guys for your support. Without it, we'd be, we'd be hoes. We wouldn't have this conference. So thank you very much. As well as the rest of our sponsors who, unfortunately, are all packing up now. Otherwise, I'd say go thank them in person. But all that said, today we're going to talk. Oh, I skipped that. We've already talked about the sponsors. Um, I work with Voss. Uh, we are an automation company. We focus on UC Telecom. So if you've got Cisco, you've got Microsoft, you've got WebEx, you've got you name it, right? We'll tie into that. We'll help you manage your day-to-day -day tasks, whether that's setting up uh, sites, managing sites, role-based access control. If you were here last year, you saw my session that very kind of talked a lot about what we do. I highly recommend you go online to YouTube and watch that. It'll kind of pre-build for what we're going to talk about today. I come from the actual integrators world. Uh, I, I've spent years and years and years doing actual deployments, primarily of direct routing, complex direct routing environments, um, w uh, all over the world. All right, that said, the problem we have with Teams today is that as beautiful a job as Jamie Grant and the team at Microsoft have done building a really pretty interface in the TAC, not everything we want or need is in the TAC. Uh, Big problems really come from the fact that, hey, what the heck happens when I have a giant user base, right? My customer has tens of thousands of users, hundreds of thousands of users, right? Um, I may be in a specific industry that requires special compliance and or segmentation. Maybe I'm government and I need to say, hey, I have a master tenant and I have 20 different departments. I've got the Department of Ag, the Department of Industry, and I need my IT people to be able to handle only the people that are in their particular use case or whatever. And, and while Microsoft is working on building administrative units, right now they don't apply to Teams, and they're coming along, slowly but surely, they're coming. We have our complex use cases. You know, what happens if I'm a carrier, right, and I'm trying to support a crap ton of customers that we all have different needs. They are, some need call queues, some don't, some need paging, some don't. Well, what do we do with all of that, right? How do we handle that in a way that makes it easy for someone who's not me to on the day-to-day -day onboard these new complex users. Well, then we take that and we take it one step further and they figured out, oh, well, to do this for customer A, I've got to have 50 different sets of policies that may or may not be site-based, that may or may not uh, have to apply based on an active directory group. How do you apply these policies? And then, cap it all off, you've got two or three people max working on your team's you know, help desk or service desk, and they aren't going to necessarily be phone people. They're going to be, you know, maybe they came from SharePoint. Maybe they came from Exchange. Uh, how do you handle managing teams with a small user base that may not know all the ins and outs? Well, as we've talked about, with teams with features depth, and specifically with phone, all of a sudden we're dealing with all of these many, 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 many different features. Some of them brand new. They come out hard and heavy. You know, every time Microsoft announces a new feature, boom. Now we have new commands and new controls, and rarely are they in the tab. Right? Oftentimes they hit PowerShell and either just stay there or it takes six months, a year, and they finally show up in TAC. Uh, we've talked about the policy sprawl. You've got all these different policies. You've got voice routing policies. You've got leading policies. You've got app policies. You've got, you name it. We've got it all. Um, then take the scale. We talked about scale. You get multi-geo, multi-language. Maybe you're trying to integrate with you know, Cisco. Maybe you're trying to integrate with Avaya. Maybe you know, you're in a hybrid use case. Then, one of the big questions I've gotten asked time and time again when I talk to customers is, how do I manage all my DID? You know, I worked with a large banking group here, and we were trying to help them figure out a solution. They had over 250,000 DIDs they needed to manage across carriers, right? They had no clue. They had Excel sheets here, Excel sheets there. They had, you name it. How do we know where, who it's assigned to, what carrier it's coming from, where it's being assigned? 
how do we do this? Uh, then we have to deal with, again, calling plans operator connect. Uh, we can't, you know, some people need to restrict phone numbers to only certain people. So we handle that. And then we, you know, I mentioned with the admin people, not everyone has the skills to do everything. And then how do you track it all? You know, what happens with the ticketing system if you're doing everything wrong? Well, let's take that and let's say, okay, I've got all these users. How can I set these users in bulk? Because the TAC has no bulk user management features. I mean, there's some sections where you can import things from a CSV like network locations, but mm, that doesn't really help us when we're trying to do user actions. How do I limit those admins to subsets of users? And then, big one for large companies, I'm onboarding, offboarding people. We've got someone in the, in the uh, audience here from the Kroger, the groceries company. You guys have to be going through baggers and check stamping, left, right, and center. I don't know if you're onboarding thousands a day, whatever it is. How do we ensure that they get all the right permissions dynamically? Well, Microsoft doesn't have a defined solution, but they have some options. And the first one they have, of course, is Azure AD Group. Now, in PowerShell, you can do some uh, group-based policy assignment. If you have the Teams Premium license, you can do some of that in the TAC. You can use PowerShell, of course, if you know what you're doing and you want to write everything through PowerShell scripts and you want to do a bunch of things manually or you know how to remotely trigger it. Then we're going to get into where we're going to have some fun today. We're going to start talking about how can we say, okay, I'm going to use these things, groups, PowerShell, and I'm going to figure out, hey, how can I abstract this in a way that I can now query it? So I can say, hey, I have, whether it's an ITSM system, whether I have uh, some form of business process automation software solution that can push an API query because you've added a new user in your human resources system and it's hit Active Directory. Well, how can we build an Azure function to proxy that into Teams for us? And in our, our use case, Power Automate then can say, hey, you know what, this is where I'm going to monitor. I had a, an insurance customer who during the migration didn't have a third party tool to do it, so they built a power flow that basically said, I'm gonna check a SharePoint list. I'm gonna upload to the SharePoint list the users in whatever migration stage we're gonna do. And I'm gonna have a column that says the date they're gonna cut and all the policies they're gonna get. Still, you know, back in the day before there were a lot of third party solutions. And they were able to say, okay, trigger two weeks ahead of time, send email X. A week ahead of time, send email Y. Day of, do the cut. And Power Automate could then say, okay, pull the user ETN, send it to an Azure function and say, do X. All right, well, to do that, well now you have to, in your tenant, know what you're doing and you have to build a bunch of things. One, defining the requirement. And I've had many, many customers who struggle to do say the big, hey, I need to move users, but you can't define the individual requirements. Well, once you've done that, you have to know how you're going to authenticate. And that's kind of one of the key pieces of today's session is how can we authenticate via PowerShell or via an API in a way that I don't have to have MFA, conditional access isn't going to get in the way, and that's still secure. Fortunately, and when we dig into the Azure function, and I'm going to demo kind of how this works, you can, if you want, store those credentials in an Azure Key Vault. If you know how to do that, it's absolutely possible to store whether it's a client in a secret, whether it's a certificate, whether it's an actual user credential. You can do that. Um, that said, and I, 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 I call this out every time I talk to someone potentially who has a way to fix this at Microsoft, every single voice specific commandlet in the Teams PowerShell module except those that apply to resource accounts do allow you to use application authentication show you what that looks like here in a bit. So you can effectively do anything you want with a team's voice uh, at action against any user using the authentication method I show you today, except anything that requires you to create or modify a resource account. So it kind of screws you over a bit on call keys and auto attempts. And I've gotten silence, I've gotten crickets from Microsoft on when that's gonna be fixed for that single command list. We talked about Power Apps just a little bit. I'm not gonna actually demo how to build a Power App. If you don't know how to do that, there are plenty of great people here at the conference who can talk about it. There's a lot of great content out there on how to build it, but you can leverage what we're gonna talk about today within that app to do what you need. Uh, I mentioned that, hey, you can use SharePoint list. You could use Excel files if you wanted to instead of a SharePoint list from that Power App to then automate your migration. Again, schedules can be run through that way. You can do some integration with AD or Azure AD or Entre ID as it's now called. Um, 
through whether it's the Power App, PowerShell, or other complex coding. I avoid that if I can, just because trying to do that from the cloud can be a little weird. Um, as far as auto tenants and call queues are concerned, like I mentioned, you can do everything in them except create and assign a resource account. So you can do the majority of the build out there. You still have to manually build the resource account and assign a phone number to it. But, and this is one of the things that last year I really liked calling out, at least with Power App, you can restrict who has access to them. So instead of having to say, hey, you, admin, or help desk user, or even end user, you have to be a Teams administrator or a Teams communications administrator to execute these functions. You can say, hey, only such and such groups can access this Power App, and boom, you can give them a simple form or a simple upload for a CSV to say, hey, you can do what you need to. You get some limited RBAC there, um, role-based access control. Otherwise, Power Apps can also be embedded into Teams, or if you're getting into the whole bot framework and you're writing bots, you can trigger them with bots. So you could use it as a support bot to say, hey, I need a phone number, and you could trigger a Power Automate flow. Access, like I mentioned, this is going to be the biggest piece of today's session if you're going to come away with this. Most of us, especially me, when I was getting started doing all this, I assumed I had to be able to sign in manually. Username, password, MFA, get in through PowerShell and be done. And when I talk to customers about, oh, you want to re, you know, schedule a PowerShell script to run, because back in the day we didn't have PowerFlow, Power Automate to do everything, you have to store those credentials in plain text or in an encrypted file on the computer you're going to run PowerShell from. And I can't tell you the number of security departments who just simply said, nope, not doing it. You'll have to execute this manually and do MFA every time you want to do it. Well, MFA and conditional access are wonderful things, but they shoot you in the foot anytime you want to do anything programmatically in, auto, in an automated fashion. Passwords, I think we can all agree, are part of the bane of our existence, whether it's our own or our users and the way they get stored and the way they get shared. Also, you can't use a username and a password in APIs. It just doesn't work that way, and Microsoft doesn't expose theirs anyway that way. Whereas in Azure, if you're familiar with uh, the enterprise application or the application registration functions within Azure AD, you can actually create what are called managed service principles. And these guys are great because conditional access, while you can get to the point of configuring them to apply to them, generally they don't. So when you leverage these programmatic applica applications, if you will, in Azure AD, Conditional access no longer gets in your way insofar as, hey, are you coming from location X? Are you coming from location Y? Um, do you have multi-factor? Now, you can put some restrictions on this, and these enterprise applications can be executed using your user credentials if you use what are called delegated permissions. In our use case, we're going to use what are called application permissions. My favorite, absolute favorite thing about this, because I'm a PKI nut, or certificate nut, an SSL nut, you can use certificates for your authentication method here. So whether you generate them or you use publicly signed certificates, you can use those highly, co oops, highly coveted and highly controlled certificates as your method of authentication. You can use client secrets. To me, that's the same as using a username and a password. But if that's what you want to do, you can do it. The permissions on these app registrations I'm going to show you in a second are, per are highly configurable. You can either grant basically global permissions, or you can come in and you can say, hey, I want you to only be able to read users or groups. I don't want you to be able to write to them. Um, I can tell you whether or not you're allowed to assign licenses or not. I can tell you whether or not you can even see the user's exchange mailbox uh, if you're going to do Teams Rooms things. I can tell you that. And almost more importantly, especially from companies like my perspective, from Voss, I can set up a single app registration in my Azure tenant, and I can check a couple of boxes, and all of a sudden, I can send you a single URL that you can click and as a global admin click approve, and my app now has access to your tenant. So I can now, with a single app registration in my tenant, get permission from you to use my software to connect to your tenant and do all of this. So if you're a service provider, you can use this function to access your customers in a secure way that is manageable by you, and you don't have to go through all those security hoops.
So PIM has, in this use case, nothing to do with what we're doing. PIM does not apply to enterprise applications. The caveat is, the way we do this in the way, if you go to one of the links that are in the presentation, but they will also be there when it's published, it's on Learn. If you go to uh, Teams PowerShell module application authentication, they'll actually walk you through step by step what I'm gonna show you here today. And you are actually instructed to assign the Teams administrator permission to this application. So Microsoft's own documentation requires that. This is what it looks like. So if I'm in Entre ID and I've built the thing, right, you can see, hey, I've got my client ID at the top here and I've got my directory ID. Now these are the two things I need to ensure that I'm gonna connect to whatever customer I have. I'm gonna need the tenant ID of the customer, but the client ID will always be the same, no matter which tenant, customer tenant it's in. The next thing that we have to know is how are we gonna connect? Right? What is the, uh, what is the uh, permission and what is the token, if you will? So in this case, you can see all the listed permissions that I've assigned here under API permit, oop, under API permissions. And you can see, hey, in this case, I'm allowing myself to do a lot of stuff in Teams. I've given myself Exchange Online permissions, and I've given myself Skype and Teams tenant administrator permissions. Here you can see, hey, under Certificates and Secrets, I've uploaded a certificate. I have a specific thumbprint, and I know that I have that on the, on the uh, uh, client I'm going to use to access this API. So if I'm going to have whatever my triggering node is, whether it's on-premise, whether it's in the cloud, I just have to make sure that I have that certificate there. There is a caveat depending on how you generate your tokens. You may need to ensure you have the private key of that certificate on that system, if that's the case, uh, to generate where, uh, Java web tokens. But the other thing you can do here, and this is one of the things I love about it, if you're gonna write the software and you need to get responses back from Microsoft, you can have these redirect URIs set and they can use a uh, local host or 127.0.0.1, right? So this is all done within a browser or an HTTP session. And you can have it send back the response to the request back to that redirect URI, which is really very nice. This is almost a direct draw from the Learn documentation in, in on, uh, sorry, on Microsoft's website. You can see these are the small subset of commandlets that simply don't work with what we're gonna be doing today. So if you're gonna to have to use these commandlets, you have to use a separate method. Microsoft is working on this, but I, make, I have no information on when they'll be fixed. What I, because I like to use certificates, if I'm using PowerShell, here are the two methods at which I can use a certificate to connect with. I almost always use the first because I don't like using X509, but I'm not a developer, so I'll leave that up to the developers. If you're going to use a client in a secret, it gets a little bit more complicated because there are, in fact, two backend APIs you need tokens from that are completely separate from each other. This gives you a, a, an idea of what those are and how to get there. Unfortunately, like I mentioned, client IDs and secrets are like username and password. You gotta put that secret in plain text in here or have some other secure way of getting it into the PowerShell session. Some token and password management systems have plugins for PowerShell to import these things. It depends on if your organization has it. The next big steps here that we're gonna use all of that stuff that's just been come up, uh, that I just posted on, are Azure Functions. This is where things get fun. So if you go into your Azure portal, assuming you have the permissions and you have a subscription, create a new resource and create an Azure Function. Obviously, select your subscription, select your resource group, fill in everything else. The key thing to put in here is that your runtime stack is gonna be PowerShell. This allows you to run PowerShell as a service in Azure. All right, now, on the back end, while they say this is serverless and you can use other methods here, they are effectively deploying a Windows box in the middle of nowhere to run PowerShell on for you. Here's what it's gonna look like once you've created the thing and you've created the function within it, we can say, hey, I wanna run some PowerShell. And I created this as an HTTP triggered 
function. So this means it has to be triggered using an API or some form of post request from whatever your client solution is going to be. And it's going to say, hey, as I look through here, look at the request. Hey, make sure that the request has a name in the parameter and that, hey, if there is a name, in my case, I'm going to say, use the Microsoft Teams module, connect to Microsoft Teams using that command line you saw before with my certificate thumbprint, the application ID, and then my tenant ID, assuming that it's been allowed in the tenant. And all I'm saying is, hey, give me the CS Online user and then write something to the response that says, hey, uh, hello, that person. Is Enterprise Voice enabled, yes or no? And the function was triggered successfully. That's it, right? You can make this as extensive as you want or not. And you can see in the right that, hey, running a test directly in this environment works. What's important, this is where I get to show you a little demo, is that, so here's the, here is the application itself. I can run a test directly from in here if I want to, but I'm going to show you, here's Postman, right? Here's me executing the thing directly. I'm just saying, hey, here's the, the, uh, the app authentication token that the function will give you that you can build, and then here is a name parameter. Give it to me, and I just say send it. So I could be triggering this through Python, I could trigger this through C, I could trigger this through PowerShell, curl, you name it. And you can see that, hey, when I send it, I get that same message back down here as a response from that, uh, from that function. Uh, effectively, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just an HTTP request using this thread. Um, again, you define that when you create the function itself. So if I go to the function, you can see, hey, here it is. And you can see it's enabled. If I go back to the actual Azure function that we created, this is when you create the resource, you'll have all your functions under it. So you can have this function app. I can have one function. This could be just get my user. I can have another function, uh, telepathy enable user. I can have another function assign policy XYZ. What I have, and you'll find here, this is where I upload my certificate so that I can reference it from within the app. You also have to in here through some little convoluted sections go into your app files. You actually have to upload the Teams module uh, like it's an offline install so that the module is there. But once you've done that, now I can trigger this. And the beauty of this is it is in and of itself an API endpoint. So I can trigger it directly like you saw through Postman. Or if I'm using our app, Spider Automate, I use a function block that says, hey, trigger an API, uh, REST API endpoint and say, hey, do X with it. And if you're using Power Automate, you can source your information from wherever you want, whether it's that Excel sheet, whether it's a uh, Microsoft form, um, or you could say, hey, HRIS system or ServiceNow, because there are function blocks for Power Automate for that. I can say, hey, send an, H, you know, an API request from ServiceNow. You know, new user has been requested and approved. Here's the information. It hits the Power App. Power App then says, okay, I'm going to pull this information out of that request, send it to this, and roll it. Great. No, so what I'm doing here, and this is where things get a little bit funky, is you go to the, you have to do this through what Microsoft calls the advanced tool, which is called Kudu. You actually have to upload the folder, the actual module. You can't do install module teams in this sucker. Um, same thing, you just go in, you upload the updated folder. So you have to download on whatever machine you're working on. And then where are you? Files is there. Oops, go back. Where? One too far. I'm going to go to my debug console for PowerShell. And you can see here's the folder bit. Under site, I mean, this is all properly documented on how you upload modules online. I'm going to go to my, uh, I think that's pretty much. You create a modules folder, and I could upload graph PowerShell module if I wanted to. I could upload the Exchange Online module if I wanted to. Right, whatever I'm going to use for this specific function is going to be here. Um, in my case, 5.6.0 is what's in there. Um, you could load 6. You could load whatever. 
And all of that then when I'm in my actual function. Uh, you'll see that's where when we say import module mod stuff being separate. And then we still have to run the connect using the, the, the authentication function. Yeah. Right. Right, which is why I don't do it that way. Yes and no. Azure Functions is quick and easy for me to just spit it out and be done with it. If you use the Azure Automation function, which is pretty similar, and it's got some things more streamlined than others, where you can define modules, it's really going to be up to what are your programming requirements. How do you want to access it in your application? Yeah, that, that too, right. How familiar are you with one or the other? Azure Automation, to his point, has a little button on the left that says, what modules do you want to run with? And it'll just boom. Um, I'm just more used to and more comfortable using functions as a proxy in the cloud if I don't want to run PowerShell on, on prem. Pretty nice and easy. So as you can see here, yeah. So there was the uh, import the module and boom. Now the, the, the question, and you know, Michael, you and I are going to have to bite our tongue on this one. Um, you know, Alexander pointed out in his Hacks Attack sessions, which you can go watch online, he's had several of them. If you go into your debug console in a web browser when you're in the TAC, you're going to see the API endpoints that TAC is calling. And you can see your token from your user login that you can use. Now, when we sign in using the thumbprint there, or you see um, there are ways to do it uh, directly against that same API programmatically through uh, what is the Java web token, if you're using Python, or if you're using um, client secret through like Postman, where you can programmatically get that token. Um, but the APIs themselves that are exposed in the TAC, or if you run Fiddler behind your PowerShell session, are not published by Microsoft. They are not supported for end user use by Microsoft. Use at your own risk is kind of the point. Those APIs you can get in trouble for using if you try and query them directly. It's up to you. That's one of the reasons I like using the function and the Azure Automation is because I can basically build my own API that I know I can support and I can modify, and Microsoft has nothing to do with it. They can't say you can't use this because I'm just querying their PowerShell anyway. So Microsoft have asked and asked and asked. I'm sure Michael and Alexander, you have too. Plenty of people here. When are we going to have APIs to access Teams directly, right? Every time I ask the question, it's meh. We don't know. We don't care. Use PowerShell, right? That's effectively what I get. Um, I do, you know, I have heard that there is a plan to modernize the API and replace what's there because it's a legacy of the Skype for Business uh, APIs. But I don't know. And I'm exposing those PowerShell commands via an, an HTTP endpoint um, that effectively is an API. Yeah, it's just, a, I mean, REST is just an, an HTTP you know, a format, really, basically. Um, that said, you can go through all that trouble. You can spend all the time to build that, especially if you don't have the budget or there's political or legal reasons you can't use a third party solution. But, I come from one of the third-party vendors. There are plenty of third-party vendors here. We've taken a lot of the time to go through and figure this out. And whether we use the APIs directly or we use PowerShell, that's up to the vendor to, do, to decide. But we're going to, at the core, use that application registration right? somehow. Right? I know, Michael, you use, you know, when you create a Teams Boss account, right? you have to approve the app registration from Teams Boss. Right? They're using that hosted model. right? We can we do the same. I mean, you talk to anyone else here who's doing it, right? You can use a third-party solution. We're going to use that same back-end access to access either whether it's PowerShell or it's direct to an API, um, especially for Exchange, right? 
Some of us add more features than others. It depends on what you're looking for. So if you're looking to just do basic day-to-day -day user management, you could write something on your own if you're trying to do migrations, same thing. If you're looking for you know, something that's going to say, hey, I just saw a new user in Active Directory, I can see they're in site X or site Y, and you want to start adding intelligence, third-party solutions might be the way to go for you. Uh, yeah, there are plenty of them out there. Um, I know I, one of the complex solutions I've seen uh, both within my own organization and others have brought up from customers is, hey, I've got the score of IAP. I've got Teams. I need to have both because I have call center on premise. I have all these other things that I want. You know, most of these solutions have the ability to say, hey, here's all the settings you have in your source. Let me push it to the second, right? And you can say, hey, you know, this user has been identified as at site whatever, so you can set your templates to automatically push it. So for some of those things that require the Teams Premium license, like policy packages, right? Well, the third-party solution can do that by abstracting it. The other thing the third-party solutions do, uh, just about all of us, is we, we take that role-based access control and we really break it down. So we can say, hey, we're just you know, querying this API using a centralized token. But we have the ability to say, hey, you're an IT help desk one user from Topeka, Kansas, and you're only allowed to access the people in the southeast portion of the US to sites X. And then what we can do is we can filter all the users based on that. And same thing with DIDs. We can only show you DIDs that are tagged to sites within that. Like we have a DID manager. So we can do all of the database backing. We can do all of the logic. We can do all of the intelligence. And we can say, hey, now go use whether it's an Azure function, whether you're using Azure Automation, whether you're using some other endpoint to proxy that PowerShell. We're using that uh, intelligence to then go ahead and say, Let's make this happen. Let's make this happen programmatically. I think one of the things Ross, I think, is in the back. Um, you know, one of the one of the use cases we see a, a lot that I love is ServiceNow integration. We want to trigger workflows from ServiceNow. Why not? That's where having these APIs come in handy. So you can say, as soon as something gets approved in ServiceNow, go. And then all you have to do from a tech perspective is come in when things break and do it manually. Questions? I know that was rather fast. I can do other demos if you have specifics that you want to see. Yeah. Effectively. Right. So what you're not having to do is go and create all your PowerShell, define your CSVs, or define whatever your input's going to be. We're going to do all of that intelligently for you, and we're going to let you define the workflows. We're going to let you say, here are conditions A through Z, and then we're going to do all that work for you. In our case, certainly. Uh, it's going to be different based on the different vendors that do the similar thing. But almost all of us are going to be using some other form of database where we ingest, whether it's direct from Azure AD, direct from on-prem, your HRIS, whatever it is. And then we're going to match it all up with your on online bits and pieces. That's up to you. I mean, whether you use our application or someone else's, right? You can set things to happen on a schedule. You can do manual syncs. I mean, all you're going to do is do get user from Microsoft Online, match it on a UPN, and, and go from there. I mean, the one thing that you can't do with what we're doing here is devices, right? Alex, you know, has, you know when he, he was doing the hacks attack, right, you can see when you're looking at devices, you can look at the tokens, you can look at the APIs there. But you can't generate a token for those APIs programmatically the way we can for the Teams API because you can add that Teams API to the application in Azure. They haven't added that API as a permissible source there. Only the actual Teams application, which Microsoft hosts in their core Azure, right? It's the same thing, does have that function. So when you sign in there, that's why you can get that token. That's why you can see those endpoints. We can't automate that because it's not in PowerShell, and we have no way of generating a token for the API. So yeah, all we're doing is putting a different front end on all of this, but we're adding all the intelligence. We're doing all the DID management. and in our case, right, we can also add, tackle your other telephony system, right? It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's an, H, it's an API, we can talk to it, right?
Bueller. <laughs> cool. That's, I mean, I can do demos if you have interest in seeing them. Otherwise, that's all I've got for you, folks.